and to turn it around. Both parties, both parties in these last several decades, and especially in the last decade, has accepted the notion of the unitary president, which is essentially a dictatorship, allowing the president to make decisions on his own. And just, just think of the inconsistency of turning this power over to the executive branch and then allowing the president to make these decisions, writing executive orders. There should be essentially no executive orders or very, very few executive orders. And we can't have a president that goes and takes a bill and arbitrarily writes a signing statement and says, oh, I only like part of this bill, I'm going to ignore the other part. No presidential signing statements to have line item vetoes. in Washington. Do you think they should have the power to write law? Where did they get this power? The, only the Congress is supposed to write the laws, and yet bureaucrats are writing the laws all the time. Just think of the, uh, the, the Federal Register. Volumes and volumes and volumes, and if you don't understand every single regulation, you can get into big trouble. And yet, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that the Constitution is not complex? We can read it, and most school kids should be able to understand it. But that might be one of the reasons the Constitution is not taught in our public schools, because if we raise up a new generation of individuals, they might realize that this whole system of government that we're inheriting and that we're working with and trying to change is unconstitutional. We shouldn't have it. Republic, it didn't come all of a sudden. It's, it's come slowly and insidiously. The last hundred years has been tough on the Republic. But it started immediately after the Constitution. I mean, the Jeffersonians argued with the Hamiltonians, and they talked about central banking and big government and, and sedition acts. And, and so the fights were going on very early to undermine these principles that the founders understood. But today, it's been more rapid, it's insidious and slowly. But I think what has lulled so many people to sleep is been that we have been pretty prosperous. We're still fairly prosperous. But there is a big difference today and why the people are awakening is they know that it's an illusion. They know that the prosperity is actually going down and they're starting to realize that this prosperity comes from too much borrowing and too much spending and too much inflation. crowd just spontaneously cries out for the Fed to be dismantled. I haven't even gotten to that part yet. Will you do it again when I get to that part? Yeah! You know, uh, it, it is sad that uh, <laughs> we are having this threat of terrorism because of the clash of civilization. Okay. Another civilization wants to attack us because we are a certain civilization. I haven't bought into that. But there is some religious problems in the world that helps contribute to this, and there's a foreign policy problem that contributes to it. But I do believe that there is a real clash and an argument between uh, radical Muslim fundamentalists in contrast to secular Muslims. It just happens that we as a nation have allied ourselves with secular Muslims, imposed our will by propping up these puppet governments in the Middle East, antagonizing and actually giving motivation to the radicalists that wants to come here to kill us. But why should that be so, so, so strange? What if somebody came over here that looked differently than us, had different religious and uh, different values, and, and put an air base on our land and imposed their will? The one good thing that would come of that is this whole country would be totally unified because we would resent the enforcement and the occupation of any foreign power on our land.
Civilization advances when you have less power in government. The more power you have in government, the more they resort to the ancient tradition of the warrior spirit. The warrior spirit where everything is gained by going out and robbing and killing and plundering. And uh, today it's a, it's a little bit different. They plunder, they plunder through inflating the currency and taxation, but it's still plundering, but it's power in the hands of government. We had an example, a beautiful example of minimal power in our government, and then we had maximum productivity and maximum wealth. But today we think too much of the wealth and believe that government provides this rather than understanding that wealth and prosperity comes from freedom and productivity and not from the government. One ounce of freedom for the sake of security, it won't work. Besides our, besides our flawed foreign policy, there were a few other problems that contributed to 9-11. One was our lack of clear understanding of how the Second Amendment is supposed to work. And once again, even before 9-11, it was assumed the government would take care of us and be safe. They were in charge of airport security. And they, uh, they after some hijacking in the 70s, and we were all taught, one thing you never do is resist anybody that wants to take over an airplane. And certainly, the airlines wouldn't be allowed to have guns on the airplane. That would be terrible. Now we have companies in this country uh, still today, uh, these companies uh, are armored cars and they carry money around and they have guns and they do a pretty good job protecting their cargo. But we were handicapped in this country because we were dependent on the government and our cargo, us, our passengers, weren't protected as they should have been. You know, they said that, uh, no, they're too dangerous, but can you imagine what four airplanes involved? Maybe four guns, or just the knowledge that the guns were there might have prevented the whole thing. There have been some serious consequences of our lack of respect and our loss of liberty and lack of concern and defense of our republic. And we're suffering the consequences. This is what we're talking about. You know, as a consequence of our lack of concern for the protection of liberties, we have suffered tremendously from this. We don't have privacy anymore. We passed bills like the Patriot Act and the vice of legislation and won. Military Commissions Act. No Military Commissions Act. We need, we need to defend habeas corpus. And the one thing that we don't need that they're doing in the name of catching all those potential terrorists is we do not need and should not accept a national ID card. Absolutely not. Do not take the mark of the beast. Do not take that thing, people. Don't do it. Resist. No ID. No ID. No ID. No ID. Spontaneously, the crowd cries out for no ID. There's another war that's been going on for a good many years, but especially since the early 70s. We have spent hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars on this particular war, but it's been war on American citizens more than it's been a war to change these conditions. And that is the war on drugs, which has been a complete total to a condition where the states pass laws that say that if you happen to be ill, you are sick, you're getting chemotherapy, you have AIDS, and you get benefit by smoking marijuana, and the law permits you to do it, which should be permissible in a republic. No, the federal government actually arrests sick people in the name of compassionate conservatism and putting people
but some say, well, it's dangerous. You might do other things, and, and there's a danger to you on what you do with your own body. Yeah, you know, I made a comment once in a speech on the House floor. I said, yes, some of the strongest drug warriors in Washington, D.C. rant and rave about the possibility of a sick person using marijuana for their illness at the same time. But guess what? They have no hesitation to imbibe in that drug called alcohol.